Hello and thanks for stopping by. This is Tron 2.0 Killer App for the original Xbox, published by Buena Vista Interactive in 2004. I haven't popped a game in the Xbox in a while, and I haven't done a video on any core Xbox games either, so I thought I'd spend a little time with the system. I went looking through my stack of Xbox games for ones that I always wanted to play but just never did. This one came to the top of the pile. This is a first-person shooter based on the Tron universe, and it's a completely reasonable first-person shooter. This is an original Xbox game, so the graphics are great, but they are limited compared to what we started to see with the Xbox 360. This was before HDMI cables. You're going to get cutscenes, of course, and you're going to get stories, definitely, but we're going to be left with slightly blocky character models and animations that may or may not look smooth and amazing based on today's standards. In the context of the game being Tron, I don't think it feels that much out of place. Things naturally look a little robotic and machine-like, maybe, and that's kind of what I want Tron to be all about anyway. Things are made out of computer code, machinery, it's all about data. So Tron is a popular enough franchise, and it started with the movie in 1982, which was sort of when PCs were starting to become more prevalent everywhere. Video games, of course, as well. In this story, just like in the movie, a character is pulled into the computer programming world, and everything you encounter in the world is usually slightly renamed to fit within the confines of the computer environment. First, color palettes are broad and limited. This is basically a reflection of what computer monitors were like way back in the early 80s. They were usually two colors, or maybe they were one color, and then there was the lack of color, which was black. Monitors were often green and black, or blue or maybe red. And this translates to a rather monochrome world. The colors, you're going to appreciate them, or you're not going to appreciate them. I like them, but I could understand if someone's more accustomed to a color range based on modern game systems. We get 4K televisions out now. <laughs> this is not 4K. So you may or may not appreciate this. For the story, I've always considered the Tron story clever, and it works for me. This story really is not much different than the regular Tron story as it is from the 80s. It works. As far as items in the world go, most things have names somehow connected to a computer term. People in the game are called programs. When enemies die, they might drop core dumps that you can download. Viruses can infect programs and make them enemies. I'm not going to go through all of the items here, but you need to know they're unique, and every time you find something that's new in the game, it's this great little detail that's added to the world. Early on, you have a guide with you called Bite, like in the movie actually. And it's basically there to help you navigate and understand the basics of the game, and it's kind of how they push you through learning all the basics. Byte would be similar to Cortana in Halo. More people are familiar with Halo, I think. Byte is a definite parallel to that. Overall, the goal of the game is to survive and escape back into the real world. You've been pulled into the computer world and you want out. There's also, obviously, an evil program out to get you, of course. One of the things that I like with this game, but I do find it kind of clunky, is the upgrade system. You pick up upgrades to your character as you progress, little programs, and you have a level, which is your version number. And there are basically a hundred levels you could possibly attain, and as you progress, you sort of upgrade your character. I'm still struggling to understand how to navigate the upgrade screen. I've been playing this game for like four or five hours. I did not think it would be this confusing to understand, but it's the one thing in the game that I find myself staring at, and I can't tell if this is a result of the interface or the fact that I'm just going back three generations of controllers. The controllers have all these buttons. It's got a whole slew of buttons. But they're sort of, some of them are in different places, and they're similar to the modern controllers, but the way that they do things in some capacity is a little different. Some things just take a little getting used to, I guess. The weapons are what make a game like this work. First, you have the most basic weapon in the game. That's usually the core of any first-person shooter. When you think of Halo, you think of the handgun, the most basic weapon. In Half-Life, you think of a crowbar. Here, you have the classic Tron disc. This is a frisbee, basically, and you throw it around, or you can even use it as a shield. You can bounce it off surfaces, hit people with it, and you can control it a little as you throw it. It's a really fast-moving object, so you can't really steer it everywhere, but you can direct it a little, which helps. Truthfully, the disc is awesome to throw around. You can bounce it off walls, or you can call it right back to you. But it always comes back one way or the other. It's a great weapon, and it's a lot of fun to toss around. But it's not necessarily the best weapon in the game for every situation. It's definitely the default weapon, and it doesn't cost you energy to use. When you get other weapons, though, they do cost you energy. I mean, from a pistol all the way up through the cannon. 
they utilize some form of energy which is one of the meters on your screen. You have to worry about energy and you have to worry about health. When you run out of offensive energy, you'll have to resort to using just your disc. Energy is actually a really important part of the game because you have to ration it. It's not just used for weapons, it's actually used to acquire permission programs and purchase routines throughout the game. These are things that you find along the way. It'll actually cost you energy to get them. So you're going to find yourself rationing exactly how you want to use your energy. You're going to try to leverage your disc probably as much as possible. I don't think this is a bad thing because the disc is really fun to throw around. Every now and again, I ricochet a disc off a wall and I one-shot some guy in the back of the head. It's fantastic. Your other guns fall into the standard first-person shooter categories. You're going to have what's basically a handgun. You're going to get uh, a handheld weapon, stun batons, and eventually you're going to get up to heavier weapons like cannons as you progress further. Eventually, also, you're going to get to race light cycles. What kind of Tron game would this be without the famous light cycles? You'll race around and you'll try to get opponents to crash right into your light wall, as you would expect. Honestly, when they have you start playing this section, though, I actually found myself wanting to get back to the first-person shooter part of the game. If you really like the light cycle game, you can actually play it solo, and you don't have to actually get into the first-person game for it. You can play it straight from the start menu if you want. I expect this would be really good to have synced Xboxes. I know the Xbox, the original Xbox, was big into LAN gameplay. Racing light cycles around would be really fun in a group setting, that's for sure. So overall, this is a really competent first-person shooter for the Xbox. There are no game mechanics that I can't deal with, and as far as the setting goes, being a fan, this is Tron. This is exactly what I would want to play in the Tron universe. Plus, the sound effects and the music in the background are exactly what a Tron game should be. We're talking 80s future synth sounds. It's fantastic. Well, that's all I have today for Tron 2.0 Killer App. I'm going to be looking for more copies so I can land some machines together. Thanks for watching, and I'll catch you on another video.